Hi, and welcome to module two of Contemporary Business Issues. In this module, it's worth 25%. We're gonna start with part A, which is innovation in business. But as you can see, there's a lot to get through, which we will do over two, two and a half webinars. But let's get into it. Tesla, what an amazing company, but also a company that is going through some issues. Now, we all know about Elon Musk, but did we know that Tesla was set up by Mark Tarpenning and Martin Eberhard, right? And they, and they founded the company in 2003. The other thing that's interesting about Tesla is that they didn't actually start with building a car. Now, it was probably a little bit more driven by Martin at the start. He is the engineer, and he was passionate basically about or questioning about why the, oil is, uh, the world is so dependent on oil. All right, and how do you take the globe and all the people in it to move away from that dependence? He was also passionate about climate change. And of course, that LinkedIn, as you can see, a, a, an idea generating another one and another one to, well, cars use a hell of a lot of fossil fuels. Can I create an electric car? They also, of course, did see a gap in the market. And that's where Mark Tarpenning came in, perhaps more of the entrepreneurial um, business structure side of, of Tesla. So they saw this gap and they thought, we're going to try and create a car. Now, they did this, and the Roadster was released in 2008. Unfortunately, by that time, Martin had already been uh, pushed off the board. So their relationship with Elon Musk, who we all know, obviously started okay when they got him on board from previously uh, being at PayPal to selling out of that and using his money for venture capital uh, to a fair bit of tension. And I'm sure there's a whole other long backstory to that. They were amazing designers, all right? Um, but, and as the study guide talks about in an example, they weren't the best at manufacturing. And so there was a bit of a misalignment here that's caused Tesla a lot of issues that are still going today. And that fundamentally is they sold a lot more cars, they have a lot more orders for cars than they've managed to produce. They have not been able to get the production rate of their cars anywhere near what it needs to be in order to actually make money. So they're one of these companies that loses an enormous amount of money, uh, but American uh, investors, uh, bless their cotton socks, love companies like this and just keep pumping more money in. Where Tesla will end up is a very split debate at the moment. Half going, it will make it, and half people saying it's going to go bust. So in module two, we have a look at innovation, and then we also in part B need to have a look at big data. Uh, also with a bit of complexity, complex problems in the weak model and data analytics. All right? Then we get into a, a big chunk here in part C, which is blockchain, including cryptocurrency, right? including regular, uh, regulatory considerations around cryptocurrency and blockchain and adoption of blockchain. Uh, robotics, which is really this robotic process automation. So... Uh, bots and how they work and why would it be useful? Are they going to threaten your role as an accountant? Maybe if you're in junior roles, but as we talked about in module one, this whole subject is about moving you to provide strategic advice and accepting that some of those basic level accounting tasks are going to go. Uh, from uh, robotics, which is a, a sort of a lower order level of machine learning or an RPA, we have to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence all right, and then we finish off with part F in uh, data security. The learning objectives for module two, evaluate a range of business technologies for use in contemporary organisations, analyse and interpret complex information, assess the benefits and the risks of different strategies, all right, evaluate, is a higher order in Bloom's taxonomy, really, that, remember, than something like um, assess, evaluate strategies to minimise and manage contemporary business risks. Now, a lot of that's around innovation risk, okay? Now, the pre-work that I asked you to look at that's in the weekly webinars unit in our course, why is innovation relevant to accountants? What digital evolution index categories Australia are in? Out of Hong Kong, Singapore, and Korea, which country is regarded as a better innovation leader? Which country is rated as having the most restrictive barriers to entrepreneurship? All right. So for the first one, if you'd read that article, what you would have found out is that Australia is in the stall out category. So you can see stand out, break out, watch out, 
and stall out. All right, and we are, I guess, unfortunately, sitting in, uh, in, a, in a stall out. What does that mean? Look, I suppose um, th there's a number of things behind this and we don't want to go into all of them because a decent chunk is outside what the study guide's covering. But yes, things like the amount of money put in, government policy, but also down to the culture within different countries towards innovation, towards uh, the acceptance of failure and things like that. It is also interesting to see new countries like Mexico, Thailand, Brazil, that perhaps we haven't expected to see in this area of breakout. Hong Kong, Singapore and Korea, which is regarded as a better innovation leader. All right, so we've got Singapore at 7th, Hong Kong at 11th and Republic of Korea at 14th and we're down at 17th. Which country's rate is having the most restrictive barriers to entrepreneurship? All right, uh, can't see it there in the small print. India, and why would that be? Well, uh, administrative burdens and regulatory procedures. Uh, I don't know if any of you tried to do business in India. I have only attempted it once, and it is a challenging destination to try and source your product uh, which was actually, of all things, copper nails, going back a while here, uh, source your product and get it back to Australia. That was one, and then actually two businesses. And then there was also my startup in um, solar-powered milk chilling units, which was done in India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And, yeah, I, I was a bit naive to this. Uh, amazing country, amazing people, significant challenges, waiting your way through bureaucracy in order to... To, to be innovative and to set up new ventures. So in a sense, Australia's not doing too badly. And as I mentioned before, uh, why do some commentators say we are poor at innovation? Uh, certainly, and, and something like the National Building Authority, look at links also to a very funny series called Utopia on Australian television, and that is showing us that politics plays an enormous role in whether a country is progressing well with innovation um, or not. And politics, unfortunately, gets involved, especially in more democratic nations, uh, and to the detriment of things moving. And when governments change and there's political uncertainty, that's probably the biggest thing, is this idea of uncertainty, then businesses are not sure whether to invest. Investors putting money into businesses are not sure whether to invest and everything slows down and that's a that's a big issue the reason for this picture is an, an unfortunate trait sometimes seen in australia the tall poppy syndrome which is basically that unlike perhaps a country like america we're not as keen when uh people seek are ambitious and seek success and uh, sometimes perhaps more in our past than present we tend to want to bring those people back down to a more base level. So we are not always massive promoters of entrepreneurs and successful ventures. We tend to be more pessimistic. We tend to be more, and look, I've, I've had this from personal experience in, in pushing ideas around to friends, family and others. The, the first response you often get is, ah, oh, yeah, that probably won't work though, will it? Oh, I don't think you'll probably make any money out of that. It tends to be sort of a negative attitude to trying new things. And we're not as accepting of failure as certainly some Asian countries are and certainly the US, which is much more accept accepting of failure. All right, let's have a go at a quiz. Understanding how a business networks, uses channels, drives customer engagement, organises its talent and assets is all related to which concept? A, B, C or D. So pause the video now and have a go at this quiz. Give yourself no more than a minute. Okay, it's Doblin's Innovation in Business. Now it's going to figure 2.1. As far as I can see, and I'll raise this with CPA, they forgot to put in the source here. So that figure showing you these different categories of a breakdown of functions of a business 
linked to innovation is actually from Doblin's research. Now, another one that I had, and I'm not trying to uh, promote myself here because it was, a, in the end, a business that had failed, all right? But I guess these are close to heart in the sense that I understand them, so they're good examples for me to use in teaching others. So POD was a protein water. Um, it was aimed at uh, people who were committed athletes, it had 20 grams of protein, all natural ingredients. It was low in sugar, which most of the nutrition sports drinks are not low in sugar at all. Um, it you know, made you feel full without bloating you. Uh, so it's very low carbs. And the idea was we give you a protein hit after exercise. So, you know, is pod, it was in water and nobody had done this other than one other company in the States. All other protein was in milks because it's very difficult to get protein um, to hydrolyze and go into water. This is whey protein, sorry. I tried it with a brown rice. I tried it with uh, soybean or gr green pea. Pro I tried it with everything and it was all disgusting except this particular one. Is it incremental? Is it breakthrough? What do you, what do you think? To me, it's not, it'd be nice to claim this, but no, it's it's an incremental innovation. There's plenty of other protein drinks out there. It's trying to take it another step and go, let's get this out of a milk-based product that tends to bloat some people um, and try and get it into a water which is lighter and more hydrating. Uh, so there's a video in the LMS. Please have a look at that about innovation. What it's trying to cover is uh, a key concept at the start of this part, which is radical or incremental innovation. All right. In uh, radical can be seen the same as breakthrough. Okay. If we think about something like um, FlexiCar. So FlexiCar is basically a, a new work on car hire. So instead of getting it from the airport, you can pick up a flexi car at all sorts of locations in suburban areas. So this is aimed at helping people that don't want to own a car in Melbourne, right? They don't want to own a car. They live in an apartment um, and there's a car downstairs that they need once a week, once a fortnight. They live close to the city, right? They probably, uh, well, are often single or married without children so or the children are young they're not let, yet driving to football practice soccer music swimming and everything else that we have to do once the kids grow up so what do these guys do different it's around their marketing as well they have special offers discounts they have prizes uh, but it's also about it being very easy it's about it being mobile on an app being able to pick from different types of plans or different types of products, whether it's subscription or just purchase as you need it, being able to join online, being able to get into your car with the swipe of a card or pushing a button on the app on your phone and be able to just take off and drive it. Incremental or breakthrough, the changes in luggage from chest to handle to two wheels to four, I mean, it's, it's incremental innovation. And the important point to make here too is a lot of innovation is incremental and there's nothing wrong with that. So if we jump back to something that's, that's radical breakthrough, Graham Clark, the cochlear implant, okay, allowing deaf people who have been diagnosed as profoundly deaf to be able to hear. Amazing. That is breakthrough innovation. In a sense, and you could say Ryanair is a bit later, we should go back to Southwest Airlines. But low-cost airlines at the time was just never heard of, never done. The airline industry was controlled by the big players and always had been, right? That is radical innovation to be able to change the way uh, an airline operates and convince the customer that you can have your knees jammed to the seat in front and you, you can put up with not having any food on the flight, you've got to pay for it, but you can get an ultra-cheap seat and you can get from A to B. All right, Uber, you know, fundamentally disrupted the taxi industry. So some of these, and look, don't worry too much about being absolutely set in whether one is incremental or, or radical. 
just accept that there's both types. And I think also take on the point that in a lot of cases, incremental innovation is just as valuable. It probably just takes more time. Tennis rackets have, have changed from, from that to whatever fancy head racket Novak Djokovic uses here, all right? All the way to carbon fibre from timber. Sustainability um, related to innovation, something like mushrooms with IKEA, mushroom-based packaging, okay? To replace polystyrene, it's, it's another, probably an incremental innovation. It's going another step. It's still talking about packaging, but pretty cool, made out of mushrooms. Now, I was, although Doblin's is only really mentioned briefly in that figure, I just want to go a step further because it's a really important one. Uh, and for this reason, it has all these, these uh, attributes here from profit model, network, through to product system, through to things you know that are, or that are standard to most of us, channel, service, brand, customer engagement. All right, if we think about something like FlexiCar, it's actually hitting a number of these points. The, the product performance in the sense of the, the product is I can go and get a car and it's two streets away, not I have to get on a tram or a taxi to go somewhere for 15 minutes to a, it's like a car yard, a higher place to a thrifty to pick one up. All right. Um, the, the channel, sure, it's online. The brand, only after a while. Brand's not something FlexiCar can use at the start. The profit model, yeah, it's a bit different. It's cheaper. They want you to take more trips. Um, they want you to use it as a car to get around in rather than a tourist coming to the city and using a car for five days, dropping it back at the airport and leaving, or a business customer, right? Are they doing a bit more in customer engagement with their prizes and their deals that come up? Sure, that's, that's what they're trying to do, okay? The way that they structure the business, in, this is the way that they use their assets in the business, to, uh, to, to deliver an innovative product. The way they network with others is also important. KE support courses, I try to have a think about that. Okay, so structure, yep, the way that we use subject matter experts, um, but also marketing comms and that sort of stuff. Um, our profit model, now it's different. It is different this year because we're partnered with CPA, but in the past we were freemium. So um, now networking, it's a dotted line there because it's not something I, I could say to myself that we really leveraged on that. But the profit model, although standard different to traditional education where you're not out there hunting for your customer, we were. We we're writing lots of blogs, having YouTube channels, drawing people in to say, hey, we can help you with your, with your CPA. As you know, we're huge on customer engagement. Our brand is a dotted line because we're four years old as this knowledge equity brand uh, support in accounting and finance education. It's not big enough yet. We can't claim that. Our channel, yeah, it's online. Be good if it, if it was online and through other types of channels and corporate partnerships, which, yes, we have now a CPA, but we need to develop more. Service is big for us. And, of course, the product does need to perform. But what's interesting about this is with Dobbins thing, when they did all of this analysis, right, they found that the value is not where people expected. People expect the value to be here. I have this innovative product. It's amazing. I have this system. It's amazing. I have really good service. But the value from different types of business doing innovation, majority of it came from this idea of networking and the business model under an, um, an umbrella of finance, right? More value was generated out of that than the actual offering itself. We're talking about the structure of the, the company and what it's selling, okay? So, yes, brand's still important. Customer experience is still important. Um, processes are still really important. But just, just interesting to me that this is what they found. So much value was created here. And it is through things, you know, like, the, um, like a Spotify, the business model subscription, totally changing it from... Uh, selling you a CD, subscribe and get everything. Oh, okay, but you got to listen to these horrible ads, pay us a little bit of money and we get rid of the ads. How do we network? Well, in that sense is we have, they've networked with all of the recording um, companies
companies in order to get licensed their material and then networking directly with uh, new artists who can just upload songs onto the onto the Spotify Spotify platform. All right. Now, another thing that's talked about in the study guide is where do good ideas come from? So the video we put into our LMS, please have a look. It's a great, great little video. Um, Chance favours the connected mind. I don't need to say any more than that. It's about the fact that things are hunches. It's about the fact that, you know, even radical innovation is generally not just a one light bulb moment and then you sketch it all out and it's, it's done. It just doesn't happen like that, as I'm sure many of you know. Entrepreneurship, it's a dynamic process of vision, change and creation. It requires the application of energy and passion and it sort of goes on and essential ingredients and, wow, that, that just didn't work for me. Entrepreneurship is about solving a consumer problem and in the process creating significant value, often where incumbents have not seen to exploit it. Entrepreneurs are looking for gaps in the market, right? Uh, I can't remember who described it as this. It might have been... It actually might have been my old entrepreneurship teacher, I think, from um, Melbourne Business School. I think. Great guy called David Austin, an amazing person. Um, entrepreneurs, they're people that make things happen, right? And it, they have a fair bit of energy and a lot of drive and they can be pushy. Elon Musk's don't look like they're the nicest people to always work with, but they are people that are pushing to make things happen. Innovation is about creating something new, okay? Just remember that. That's I believe that's the definition that's used in the study guide as well, All right? How does it work? There's lots of things. One way, a simple way of thinking about it in terms of the incremental component, you build something, you test it, you evaluate it, you change what you need to, you modify, you build, okay? Goes back to this idea of agile, doesn't it? A agile development, which has come about from the, the era we're, we're in of software and tech. Uh, so, yes, but, you know, to be fair, that's the physical part of it. And then I think you need to link that back to Simon Johnson's uh, where do good ideas come from to think about the ecosphere that you're in, the environment that you're in, the space that you're in, the fact that ideas do start from a hunch. But even then, from the hunch, you've got to build something and you have to keep going around in some sort of a loop. All right, another quiz. Tesla's growth has not been without problems from constant changing of their car designs, issues with software, and a lack of experience in manufacturing vehicles. Tesla have not been able to meet their customer demand. Which of the key characteristics from PwC's innovation benchmark survey have they struggled with the most? Pause it and have a go. Okay, I think the one that, that gets us close here is aligning innovation and business strategy, right? And it's if you have a look at the example in the study guide about Tesla, it's specifically talking about that they had this innovation, the strategy is around manufacturing cars as part of the strategy, right, and selling it. They did the selling, okay, they had all these massive pre-orders, but they didn't have their operations right, they had software issues, they... They were trying to be a car company before they had got the skills, the assets, the resources in to be a car company, all right? Uh, top leadership was all in. Elon Musk is all in to everything when he's in. Definitely a customer-first approach. You know, they're thinking about the fact that what was holding back electric cars was that they couldn't go more than about 120 to 150 k's, all right? So the Roadster was this thing that went 350 plus kilometres on a one battery load. And that was, that that just changed the market in terms of being able to sell the product. A holistic approach, perhaps some of that wasn't done right, but it's this the business strategy and the operations linking to the great idea was there, but struggled to, to get it operational. There's also another bit in the study guide around collaborative innovation. All right, that, let's go through these steps. Open innovation sharing knowledge with others, working with tech, used by 61% of the firms. Design thinking, which you hear this term a lot. If you type it into Google, you'll find 50 books just about design thinking. Embed the design concepts into the business. An iterative process which is agile because it's just so hard to, to get that incremental innovation or even a breakthrough moment 
without doing it in reasonably fast, regular steps. Um, used by 59% of firms. Co-creation, working closely with external partners, customers and suppliers, and more of the traditional R&D, developing new products, utilising uh, assets and skills, scientists and engineers used by 35% of firms. So there's a, a figure in that. I can't remember the figure number. Uh, it is 2.3. That's what I'm talking about. All right. From PwC again. So have a look at that and make sure that you got that in your index so you can get to it in case you get a question testing on it. A couple of companies, so I looked around and, and thought further about collaborative innovation. A couple of things I read, Toyota and 3M. And the reason was more about the, the culture and the setup. So it was making teams come together. It was it forcing um, project teams to be very much multifunctional and cross, what's the right word, cross-functional, um, that they had to bring different people from different areas of the business and they had to come together and work together, not the, we'll come in for a team meeting and then you go away and do this bit and then we'll meet up two weeks later and have a talk about it. It was much more, you guys are now in this area working on this particular project, right? Um, especially, I think, with Toyota around things like sustainability, but also the just-in-time that many of you would know about, um, and things like reducing water usage, energy usage in how they manufacture vehicles. Sustainability, yes, but also cost reduction. 3M are a company that, you know, from sticky notes to, to, to everything else, they have always been um, big about design. I'm sure there is there's a culture around design thinking, but also about collaboration. All right. Another one, just because I like them so much, Patagonia, linking again to I think the culture, which is that Patagonia is not completely driven by profits. They they do have a culture that they want employees to have their own time following the values of the brand, which is to explore, to go to new places, to try new things. Um, let my people have surfing time. That was a line that the owner said much earlier on in the company's history. But it was about, I don't wish to try and be in every store in the world making billions of dollars. I want to have an amazing product. I want it to be from, uh, have it a, an element of sustainability in terms of my supply chain. And I want my people, if they want to go have a surf, to be able to go and have a surf. I'm, we're not here to work ourselves into the to the ground, which in a sense is a bit different. If you listen to people like Jack Ma and Ali Barber and others that talk about the fact that everyone should do six days a week, was it, and 12-hour days, it's very different in different cultures but just different viewpoints of how we drive for innovation. So these are the, the key characteristics again. Alignment between innovation strategy, company-wide cultural support, top leadership is all in, which, of course, these two you know, have to be closely linked, a customer-first approach and holistic approach to being the best. All right? Did these guys have it all? Look, it's hard, it's hard to say. Um, I think that uh, they definitely had the top down, but I, I guess the holistic approach, you could perhaps argue, um, that this was perhaps not all there, but with this gentleman or both of them, part of their issue also, from what I understand, was a bit of a falling out with Musk as time went on, and they are probably more true to their principles um, from what I've read about Martin and where he's gone on since about moving people to a green future and we're probably stuck with, well, we've got to build a car and we're really struggling with that. But it does link in, of course, links to this next section of innovation risk, all right? Again, I was trying to think of an example, so I brought back Pod. You've got these steps in figure 2.4. Develop a model to assess risk and return. And I went, eh, did I do this with Pod? Sort of, but it was very much just a financial model. So the financial model, of course, was I sell this much, I sell this much, I sell this much, I can increase my batch size, economies of scale. Uh, my first batches that I ran were at a significant loss because 
I was not prepared to run 30,000 litres or say, you know, like um, 80,000 units, these 350 mil bottles, uh, I was running 3,000 units to trial in the market, see what was working flavour-wise, where it was selling, et cetera. The limitations of the model, uh, is there enough information to support a decision in terms of making it? So that's a difficult one. And I would say, no, there's not when you're creating a food product or a beverage and you're dealing with um, a little bit of innovation, a sense of how do I get protein to stay in the water and not taste horrible? So the limitations of the model were things like, I have no idea about shelf life testing. How long will this product last before it goes off? Buyers of the product require you to have nine to 12 months shelf life, right? So that's a limitation of a real risk there that it doesn't hold up. Ass uh, assess risk interactions. So I, you could say an unrelated event uh, would be the, the fact that um, I do remember seeing some unintended uh, public relations stuff about other people getting really stuck into protein drinks. So I was already out in stores, but I just it was more about protein shakes and milks because they didn't even know about this product. But I hadn't really considered. There were people on the radio, there were people on TV saying protein drinks are bad. We should not be having them. You can get enough protein in your diet. We eat too much red meat in Australia as it is. And yeah, I'm sitting there looking at those programs going, oh, not now. Can you just do this next year? Uh, but probably something I didn't consider. I just was hoping to piggyback onto a trend without thinking about could this trend be challenged for other reasons. Understanding users, that was an interesting one. I mucked up this. I tried to sell this to young men who wanted to um, build up their muscles, but not, not bodybuilders because they're taking heaps more protein, an unhealthy amount, but young men that care about their looks, blah, 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 blah. What I found in doing lots of trials in gyms was lots of women coming back to me. I was like, oh, okay, great. Women wanting to get fit, but saying to me, I love your drink. I have two in the morning. First thing I made is like, yeah, you don't really need 40 grams of protein in the morning as a woman. Why? Because you're doing lots of uh, weights and stuff. Oh, no, no, because it makes me feel full. So then I don't eat my 1030 muffin. All right. Oh, I did not design this drink to be a diet supplement, that supplement. Like, uh, and it's a difficult one. You're sitting there going, well, I do want to sell. There was no health risk, but I didn't want people um, men or women to see this as, oh, yeah, I buy pod because it stops me snacking. Like, damn. So that's sort of unintended um, consequence. So I did a lot of research on it, but, of course, until you sell, this is always a risk with innovation, you've got to sell the product to find out more. Infrastructure needs, yeah, difficult for me. The two things, distribution in the end is what killed me. I couldn't distribute it wide enough and fast enough. And also I had production issues, more production issues than I wanted to. Technology is driving the key risks at the moment, right? So yes, I've used a food example because it was close to home, but we know that a lot of tech stuff out there, cybersecurity is a key risk, right? Two thirds of survey respondents that's talked about in the study guide didn't know of any risk management processes around innovation, innovation projects. Data security and privacy, some of the biggest concerns. Okay, so I didn't, I mean, I was small, I was a startup, but bigger companies, the survey was showing up that many people didn't have um, knowledge of specific risk analysis around innovation projects. So yes, there's a risk assessments, there's a risk profile, the board has a, a risk register, but it wasn't being focused on innovation specifically where it needs to be. All right, and that is the end of what I want to talk about in part A. So part B, now we move into big data, analytics, and a little bit about complexity. Uh, I always like to start with a story. Target, big data gone tropo. Why would I pick Target? Well, Target, like many, many other retail companies, tracks the pages that you're on. So when you're online, you're in there, you're looking at products. doesn't matter whether you clicked add to cart or not. It knows that you're being on that page looking at that particular product. 
it assigned, decided to assign a pregnancy prediction score to individual users. So these are people that are spending time on their website. You might be able to guess this story about what's going to happen. By analysing the types of products, it could estimate the due date for birth and supposedly within a reasonably accurate time frame. All right. Why would it want to do all this? Well, because we can use it for sales. We can send out deals for people. We can, we can send them targeted ads through social media linked back to a target website about prenatal, postnatal products, right? But a father storms into a target store to berate them for sending his teenage daughter coupons for postnatal products, basically sending her stuff to say, hey, we kind of know that you're pregnant. You don't say it outright. So here are these products because we know that you're pregnant and, uh, and these are the sorts of things you're going to want to buy for your, for your baby when he or she is born. His father's gone. Are you nuts? You've sent this to a teenage girl. But Target was correct. The father didn't know. His teenage daughter was pregnant. Now, okay, so, yeah, Target got it right, but it didn't get the PR right at all. All right, so this is not a, oh, yes, Target was right in the end, it's all okay. This is, this is the challenge, one of the challenges around how big data can be used. It's tr they're trying to be predictive here, okay, they have an obligation to sell more product, make more profit for their shareholders. Yes, they do. But, you know, they didn't know the age of the person they were sending the coupons to, but they've got an issue here in how they use, um, analyze and use big data. Big data quiz. 90% of the data available to analyze is unstructured, right? By 2020, 200 billion devices Oh, this is just nuts. We'll generate different types of data. Which of the four Vs does this relate to? A, B, C, or D? All right. Relates to variety. And you can go and look at, oh, one of you guys will know, whichever figure is the right one there, 2.6. All right, 2.6, you can see there the four Vs. You can also... Hear about the four Vs in our LMS video about big data, all right? Which, uh, which has got some horrible acting by me in it, but it's trying to make the point about how we're tracked, how big data can be used, especially in things like retail. It's 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 going to be used. It is being used everywhere, but retail obviously is a key area because the more you can segment and target and focus onto your customer. If you can get me when I am thirsty and I've had a long day in the garden and I just would like a cold beer and target me at that point, think about my purchasing behaviour, my decision-making at that point. I have a, an inherent demand that is more concentrated at 4.30 in the afternoon, the sun in my backyard, than I do at, um, at 9 the next morning, all right, when I'm not going to, to want a beer. All right, that's all I need to do in that section because I think it, it's fairly sure. What it moves into now is this idea of complexity. So we want to sort of make sense of the idea of a complex problem. Again, it's I'm going to try and apply it to something because it's this is a difficult little bit of uh, material here. There's an LMS video with Courtney that will help, so have a look at that. Complex problem. They sometimes get called messy problems, wicked problems. It doesn't matter. Um, just think of it as a con complex problem. Ill-structured. What we mean by that is that it often doesn't have a defined start and end. Okay, it's, it's, It is messy like that. Um, there are different key attributes. I'm going to talk about eight, I think. The study guide talks about four or five. It doesn't really matter. This is just giving an idea of how you can look at something and go, oh, yeah, that's a complex problem. Right, nonlinear interrelationships connections. I've picked this one because I think it's a massive problem for Australia, as it is for countries like the the US and the UK. Okay, it's a messy problem. It's complex. It's it's obesity in our country. The boundaries are unclear. The problem is often ill-defined. In that sense, yes, you can say someone's obese, but you've got to go to a broader thing of what does a healthy society actually look like. There's smaller interrelated problems. How do you become obese? Well, you don't eat healthily. That's one way. 
What about you don't exercise? Ah, what about you come from a disadvantaged background? Okay, how, how does this interrelate? Well, you don't have much money. What's the cheapest meal you can get? Probably Maccas. You live in an outer suburb of the city because the rent is a lot cheaper um, for your parent or parents, right? Where do these guys set up their stores? In exactly those places. Actions to fix have unforeseen consequences. In Australia, we have started this debate, and then it stopped, and we'll start again. Should we have a sugar tax, right? Uh, we won't have the debate because it's just me here. Yes, we should have a sugar tax because it, there's a direct uh, impact with a reduction of types of foods and a healthier society, and it's been seen already to have shown that overseas. But is there is there an unforeseen, unforeseen consequence that we're targeting poorer people because we end up targeting these people unfairly um, charging them more for food when they already don't have that money, much money to go and buy food. We're saying to them, hey, you should be healthier. By the way, it's going to cost you 30 40% more to purchase fresh fruit and vegetables and be healthy. There's overlap with other problems, like I said. There's overlap with um, uh, physical ailments, with mental health, with socioeconomic problems. You can't solve these things in isolation. It requires a mix. It requires sometimes tech. It normally requires social activities, economic stuff. It requires thinking about values. It, in the end, a complex problem does result or require often a paradigm shift, a fundamental shift in behaviour. Okay. It also requires in us, people, taking a certain amount of responsibility for them. Now, there's a weak model. I've actually kept these slides from last semester, this bit. Um, it's now, I don't know why, but it's now seven steps in the study guide. It was eight. The only thing they did was make step one, noticing and bracketing instead of what it used to be. Step one was start, start with chaos. I can't explain why. So I'm leaving it as it is. Starting with chaos means you accept there is more information to find. There is more to this problem. It is ill-defined. It is nonlinear. You accept that, okay? It is actually a step that you need to do. Otherwise, people move straight into the politician type mode of, oh, well, the fix is just A or B. You've got to do A or B and that's it because they believe that we're not smart enough to consider that it's not as simple as A and B. All right? You know, obesity in women as dangerous as terror threat. All right, maybe. Noticing and bracketing. So you've got to collect this information and think about things. Demographics, health, think about government spending and what areas are they spending it in. Think about lobby groups. How does the food industry deal with this? How do they do their packaging and their advertising? What is being done in schools around healthy eating? What Have tuck shops and canteens changed over the years? You move to this idea of labelling. You've got, to, you've got to bucket the data or put it in bins or buckets, right? You have to to label it in order to be able to show the relationship and the interrelationships, interlinks between different data sets, that enables you to find key areas of focus, right? Otherwise, you can't make a decision that maybe you need to look at fast food advertising on TV. How do you come to that decision, right? One way is you just say it, yes. The correct way is that you actually have to go back and you have to look for all that data and start to bracket it. But even then, you're not sure. So then you need to look for patterns, okay? That's what being retrospective means. Proceeding patterns, how do we link between obesity and different actions that we take as individuals or as government or as food companies? Now you've got to connect the ideas to the experiences and the information available to start to come up with some key descriptors, some key statements, concluding statements. All right? There's a high concentration of fast food options in lower socioeconomic regions. These regions have a higher percentage of overweight and obese people. Can we get to that statement and for it to be accepted or not? Social and systemic, right? this messy problem or complex problem has to involve community education, most likely, because we, we know it can't be fixed with one thing. To, to move to a paradigm shift, Education will be part of it. 
if a government tries to just impose one fix, like a tax, right, they will probably get the boot because it will be jumped on in a negative light, whether it's by media or their opposition political parties or whatnot, or the public will jump on it and say, you can't just do that. There's, there's no one thing fix here. Okay, taking action and communication. This is where trial and error needs to begin because you need to find out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, this is where complex problems often fall down, okay, because the risks of taking action is that something won't work straight away. And if, if you're not firm as a, a person in a position of power to do it, whether you're government or whether you're the CFO, CEO of a company, this is where you will start to feel pressure. If people see that one thing hasn't worked and they jump on it, then there comes this element of hesitation, all right? With all of this, communication should either be step eight or it should be written across all steps because it's so critical the whole way through. Good managers bring order to chaos. That's one of the things in terms of complexity in an organisation. You'll see that good leaders, good managers help get their teams and others that might be struggling with complexity and make it simpler. Accountants are dealing with complexity all the time through data and financial concepts. All right, examples of how it can be reduced, things like mapping, breaking up comple complex uh, processes into steps, complex data sets into smaller data sets, right? Working out how to get summaries that people can understand and read. Because if you present data that is just um, overwhelming to people, then no one can make a decision on it. Okay, so I spent a bit more time than there probably is allocating the study guide, but I think it's a really important concept. Okay, the next part of part B, data mining. So Cambridge Analytica, read the example there. It's really interesting. So everyone's heard of this company's name, but I think I reckon most of you don't know, like I didn't, exactly what happened. Why was it such a big blow up? Was it all about getting crooked Hillary, as Trump said? Or was it actually about the fact that our data is being taken all the time from things like social media platforms? Right? But don't just think social media. Every time you sign up to a company and you go accept conditions, you don't read all the conditions, but in those conditions is we can take your data. Fine. Once we do that, then it's about, well, how can we use your data? What is the level of privacy that we adhere to? Right, Making sure, as it should be, that that level of privacy links to the government in the country that you're sitting in and their expectations in legislation around privacy. One other thing, and look, it won't be short. I can't remember how long it is now. It's probably 40, 50 minutes. Uh, Recode Decode is a really interesting podcast. Democracy is for sale. Um, uh, Cara Schwisser, Swisher, let me get it right, uh, is talking to Julian Wheatland, who was a previous executive that probably had to leave Cambridge Analytica, but it's really interesting to listen to the podcast and I guarantee you'll learn a lot. If you've got the extra time, I, I reckon that's fascinating. Um, so is data mining worth it? Well, yeah. 2018 Qantas received $1.55 in revenue from its frequent flyer program and made $372 million on it, okay? That's, that's why, you know, that's why we get our credit cards and we try and pay for everything pay Coles and Woolies and pay our bills if we can on it and whatnot to get our points. Qantas is now making massive changes to this program. Um, I'm not sure what's prompting it. I believe some of it is a, a bit of consumer backlash. So if they make this much money, that is on you and I believing it's worthwhile getting these damn frequent flyer points, right? Having our credit card linked to it. As you decide whether it's worthwhile to have a flybys card or not. So I think what's happened here is that some people have got annoyed. I know one of the things is, because um, my wife did it, and that was around, you've got your points, but then you go and try and book a flight and it's near impossible because there's only a limited amount of seats. So I believe that Alan Joyce announced that they were going to release a lot more seats available for frequent flyer purchases, redeeming your points that you've earned on uh, through the frequent flyer program. Uh, I think... On the downside, they were going to require set higher point values for certain flights. So maybe it costs you 150,000 points instead of 125,000 points to get to Los Angeles, whatever it is. 
certainly you've got to have over 100,000 to really do much at all, right? But is it is it valuable? Absolutely. Uh, as an example, in the study guide around Woolworths, all right, and, and you know, why would these supermarkets, why would they even bother to think about car insurance, house insurance, to move to insurance products? And they're not, they get an underwriter. They don't do the insurance management. They're just selling you the premium, right? The big companies are still doing the underwriting. But why? Because they can data mine, because they know that people that purchase a lot of red meat and milk have a lower accident rate, right? For whatever reason, they're probably families who are purchasing for the family, the mum and the dad, and a number of children, right? Teenage boys that drink, you know, two litres, a litre, a litre and a half of milk every day. So for, for whatever reasons, they can link those two up. They can then, remember I said, focus and target a particular type of insurance product to these people and capture that market. Um, people that buy... I think it's right. They buy lots of rice and pasta, have more accidents, and no doubt they're probably male. So they'll have the data that's known to everybody, yes, that males was it, under the age of 25 or whatever, a higher probability of having an accident. Absolutely. But they're going so much further now. They're looking at every single purchase you've made on your credit card. What I want to talk about is machine learning, and here's a guy that does it with a watermelon. And we have a watermelon here. You know, you used to uh, go to the store, pick up a watermelon. Uh, maybe your family told you, you push on the end to see if it's soft and that means it's a good watermelon or if it smells a certain way. That's how you tell if it's a good watermelon. Well, with machine learning, you don't do any of that. You basically try to determine all of the attributes about this watermelon that you can. And you take those attributes and you feed them into a baby machine model that knows nothing. Um, how fat the stripes are, how thin they are. And, and you, you feed all these attributes into that model, you go home, you eat the watermelon. You come back in the next day and you tell that model, that was a good watermelon. And it remembers all of those attributes and the fact that it was good. And you're gonna do that every day for the next 10 years. After 10 years, that model is gonna be able to tell you based on attributes that you give it, if the watermelon you've picked up is good or bad. And you may not know why that that model is telling you it's good or bad. Um, but you can trust that it has done enough analysis and it can tell you a percentage, a surety of whether it's good or bad. That when you pick up a watermelon, give it the attributes, if it says it's good, you can take it home and it will be good. Cool. So I just like the explanation because, well, it's, uh, it, it's short. Yes, it's just a watermelon. But what it's trying to show is that machine learning comes about from code being written that requires inputs, more and more inputs, and it learns. It, it has inputs, there's an output, it looks at the output as an input and does exactly the same thing over and over again, all right? And it's about computing power. Th that ability's always been there to be able to code to do that, but the computing power has never been there. And the introduction of things like a quantum computer just completely changed the landscape of what we can achieve in both machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are essentially very similar. You know, in a way to me, kind of the same thing, but AI is then at the higher level. So it's algorithms that learn directly from their data inputs, right? And I started to think about it. First thing I get my head around, <gasps> practice exams, the written component, not for you guys, but for GSL. Thousands of these things to mark. Not that much fun. How can I do it? So I looked around as to what was being done in this space. And this is basically what I learned. If I mark 50 written responses and the machine learning observes this, then I mark another 50, it learns more, right? So I've marked 100 and it's picking up. I give the system my rubric. Now, your rubric is your marking grid that a teacher uses to say, if these points were found, 0.25 and mark these points one, these points 0.75, and you get to your total, four, six, 10, 12 marks. And so that's the way that you'd be consistent. You'd be fair to students, you mark against a rubric. So I give my rubric to the system, the code takes over and marks the next 20, right? Could be 20, could be 50, could be 10. What's important is that it stops at that point or I stop it, I review, I make changes, 
then the code look the code takes those changes as new inputs to go oh i've got to refine more go back to the watermelon you're marking it to say well these you got all these ones right but these four watermelons were underripe why were they underripe well we we actually didn't tell you machine learner um, about the fact that when the, the yellow and green stripes are too close together that signals it's not right or with a particular size or something that we hadn't done so we put that input in and then the process goes on and on and on and that's how it that's how it works no i can't do it this semester it's not ready but i did notice uh through another recode decode podcast from Kara uh, swisher that pearson education are trialing this right now right and the ceo is talking about it they haven't got it right yet but they're trialing it so the game in education is changing as well. The tsunami is coming. All right, in this next section, we're gonna talk further about data analytics and visualization of data. And let's start with the quiz. All right, wave power technology relies heavily on weather and tidal patterns. In order to estimate maximum energy outputs across a year, the designers of these systems look at millions of data points of past weather and tidal patterns. All right, this is an example of which type of analytics? Pause and have a go. Okay, this is predictive analytics. We're using looking at past data sets, trying to predict what's going to happen in the future so that we know um, when maximum energy outputs are going to be across the year. When are, when are our tidal machines going to work really well and when are they not going to work so well? So three types of analytics is described here uh, in the study guide, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, all right? Try and think about it this way. Descriptive, you put the data in, you run basic calculations. Excel, that's, that's a, a platform that you can use, okay? So you jump in there, you enter the data, you write some formulas, okay? Even if the formulas are ifs, you can do a bit of visual basic coding, they're all formulas that are, running calculations around the data points that you've put in to give you ratios, to give you a trend analysis or, or whatever it is. Predictive, you're considering things now like seasonality. You, you're looking at past trends, but you're, move, you're now taking that to say, I want to estimate the forecast. So you've got to take in a lot more data points. You can't just look at a past trend of a month to then estimate what might happen five months down the track. How can you use this? Well, sure, things like customer behaviours. You're testing that, you're trying to understand when should we put things on sale? When should we discount? What days of the week do I get a better open rate on our emails to you guys, to the students? All of this stuff I've done before in terms of the way that we use MailChimp. Uh, when we used to do sales campaigns, when we did them, how we did them, AB splits, use of colours, everything coming back to what have I got in the past as a data point that I can estimate might be successful in the future? Prescriptive, all right, prescriptive analytics. Now, I think one way to think about prescriptive is to move in this idea of game theory a bit more and the fact that you've got, you can have different nodes and you're trying to work out things like maximum payoffs. So you might know a bit about game theory and probability. You've got two choices, don't worry about what this particular thing is. It's more just a visual graphic. Um, you've got a choice where you can go down a path, sorry, three choices, three different paths, and then you reach another node. And those nodes can be uh, an event node or a decision node. And where they're decision nodes, you can path off much. You can serve more food or you can do nothing, right? And if your, if your node ends at an end point, that's what happens, and you can have a payoff at each one. And what you do here is you start to multiply, you work backwards, you can multiply your payoffs. So when this tree is actually got three and a half thousand branches coming off it, you can still, what they call roll back the, the tree, was a term, roll back the um, decision model to find things like maximum payoffs. So you're trying to then use that to make decisions on where, which way you should move on a particular strategy even. Now, we've got this, I and mean, then we've got this thing of data visualisation. So we know, we've seen all these big, big tables in Excel that can have, um, we can have like heaps more rows now. I 
can't remember, 100,000 rows, whatever data, and how, how many of the columns that you've got. And this is how things have been presented, and we, we all know Excel graphs, don't we? We should as accountants. But, yeah, things are starting to change. Um, heat maps have been around for a while, but, of course, now it's about the amount of data they can get in and crunch and the accuracy level that they can they can get to is so much greater. So here's an example um, from one of the software companies that the study guide mentions. Can't remember which one I've taken it from. Um, examples of what some of the visualization representation can be. Okay, so this is California drought conditions 2013 to 2015 using a heat map, but therefore you've got to have um, not just temperatures, but no doubt you've got to have uh, humidity and levels of water in the ground, I don't know, where the water table is and how it's changing to show you the, the areas of drought, rainfall, obviously. Another example, what about people visiting an airport? So not only how many people have come in, um, when they went to, sorry, I know this is small, but whether they went to restaurants, uh, whether they went to retail shops, um, wherever they went to, but then physically, where were they? So you can show, again, using uh, different colours and a diagram of the actual airport. So these are all the gates running out in the different directions. But then you've got mini restaurants here and shops and whatnot showing where the visitors are actually going. Why would you do that? So you can estimate resource. You can estimate where new shops should be. You can estimate which areas the cleaners should be in longer at 2 in the morning um, to keep the place looking good. A couple of key things here about multi-dimensional multi -dimensional visualizations. Two things, data representations and manipulation. In data representations, I want you to remember that things that you can do, use color and shape, use intensity and size. Think of a, a bubble chart. So you've got the bubbles of areas and that might be the average um, house prices and then you've got how many houses were sold, okay? So then the volume might will make the bubble bigger or smaller and you put that across a geographic map, you can show warehouses are being sold and also what the average selling prices are for different areas, right? Using animation is obviously another way of representing data to somebody. With this, you've got to consider data manipulations, okay? That can be things like changing the scale or introducing a new scale. The way that you group variables so that the, com the complexity with metadata, metadata is just the first row in the Excel of all the different data categories. But the more data we get, the more we can break it up. Then you've got this issue where you've got, you know, 400 categories of data. What on earth do you do with all of that? Well, you think about how you can bucket it. Which ones stay in? Which ones need to go? You, you've got to get a valuable output at the end. So grouping variables is a way of doing that. And another way manipulation is condensing categories in order to find the most valuable insights you can from the data. And this is really challenging, absolutely. Okay, quick quiz here, what's wrong with this graph? A, B, C or D? There is too much chart junk, all right? I know that's, that term might sound weird, but it's in the study guide. So please have a look um, at that section on data visualization, and you'll be able to tell me what it is, but page 97 around there, 96, 97, um, chart junk, meaning that basically what they say is these, these funky looking 3D uh, charts that we've all done in Excel at some time in our career are not actually that amazing because it's difficult to tell the difference. Okay, so is this one higher or lower than that one? Right, because in the sense it's not 3D that we're looking at a 3D representation on 2D screen or a 2D piece of paper. What's the actual difference here between this one, this one, and this one? It's really, really hard to see. All right, it's too much chart junk. The other thing to consider with uh, visualization, uh, zooming and panning. So zooming is the ability to go in and in and in. So so you know that it's. Um, uh, that we talked about car accidents before. You know that it's um, under 25 or under 26-year-old males in Australia that have a higher probability of car accidents. I want to dive in. Whereabouts do they live? I want to dive in. What sort of industries do they work in? 
I want to dive in. Um, what's their average income? What sort of cars do they drive? I want to understand more and more and more about whether there's an insight as to which are the most at risk, okay? Panning is where you zoom the focus on other, other areas. So I'm diving in on detail and then I can focus on other areas. Uh, perhaps I, I, I have since sort of zoomed out and I pan across to consider um, weather conditions and other things in terms of the, the amount of accidents and start to look at that. And then probably you would pan across and then zoom in again. All right, so there's the sort of two, two things that, it, that it, again, we've always done, but the power of technology, be able to do it with a couple of clicks is change stuff. Okay, we'll finish off this section with big data and accounting. So accounting applications, management accounting, documenting and understanding business needs, right? Um, assisting with data-driven decisions. That's what SMAs are, should be trying to do in terms of utilising and working in teams where you're interacting with lots and lots of data. In advisory services can be things like modelling improvements for business processes because you have all this data. So advisory, big data, Six Sigma, being able to go in and advise on how to make very, very small changes but across a massive economies of scale, huge cost reductions. Improving tax performance, an area I don't know anything about, so I'm saying nothing more. Financial reporting, analysing transactions, all right? Audit. Interrogating all transactions, reducing the chance of missing non-compliance. Audit's a big one to me because auditing is traditionally taking a sample, having a look at that sample, how do you know they got the sample right? The sampling methodologies and the partners come in and they talk to the board and chief risk officer about how they're going to do that. But the fact is you're not analysing every transaction. And some people that want to hide things will always be able to hide it well, as we would know from all sorts of news stories in the financial services industry that, and a Royal Commission. Okay, there are um, four key areas and some sub points to think about when you read that section towards the end here of Part B on big, big data and accounting. Summary of Part B, we looked at had a look at target and we and uh, in terms of thinking about big data where it can go wrong and just putting this one up because I want you to again remember this idea of complexity in the weak model okay that's those first two there we went further and we had a quick think about data mining both the the power of it for a Woolworths to sell insurance the danger of it from a Cambridge Analytica which you can read an example or go further go go deeper and really master and understand that have a look at the podcast or look up other things. There's so much on data mining on the web that you can look at. Um, targeting customers, as I talked about, at an individual level helps you be able to sell products. Understanding descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive data. Data visualization, multi-dimensional representations, representations and manipulation. Applications to accounting that we just mentioned briefly then. Um, think about how it's applied, strategic management accounting, advisory services, financial reporting, and auditing. And auditing will come up again and again because in the next section, we will talk about things like blockchain, which are pro it's probably going to fundamentally change auditing. And that is the end of part A and part B of module two. Thank you very much for listening.